Welcome to Headlock, the official podcast of the John Locke Foundation. I'm Mitch Kokai. The 2020 election turned into a mess. Election results unresolved, concerns about the integrity of vote counts, a general state of electoral chaos. What can we do about it? What should we do about it? Our guest in this edition of Headlock has some ideas for addressing those questions. He has offered those ideas in recent columns for the Epic Times or Epoch Times for our British listeners. Robert Nadelson practiced law for a decade, then served as a law professor for 25 years. He's author of The Original Constitution, What It Actually Said and Meant, also had a career in Montana politics, including running ballot initiatives and once running and coming oh so close in a governor's race. Uh, Supreme Court justices have also cited his work as recently as this year. Welcome to Headlock. It's good to be with you. So you looked at this election mess and uh, put your fingers to keyboard and came up with some ideas of of how to address this. Let's talk about the first of these columns, which had the headline, uh, The Constitution Offers Ways Out of the Election Mess. Surprise, surprise, the people who wrote the Constitution actually designed a way for us to deal with problems like this. Tell us, uh, tell us how the Constitution addresses this issue. Well, before I do that, Mitch, I, I want to thank you for giving me credit for use a key, using a keyboard. Most people think I use a quill. <laughs> um, the Constitution has a provision for those who were wonks. Uh, it's Article 2, Section 1, Clause 4 which is called the same day clause. And it was adopted because the founders knew that if you stretch an election over a long period of time, you're likely to run into problems. People may move from place to place and vote more than once, as uh, some uh, leftists have been suggesting that people now move to Georgia in order to vote in that, uh, in that state senatorial runoff. Uh, There also are disparate kinds of treatment of ballots that occur when you have an election from time to time. Uh, Candidates have various opportunities for mischief when you stretch out the election a long period of time. And so the founders put in the Constitution a provision called the same day clause, and it applies only to presidential elections. And it says that Congress may establish a uniform day nationwide by which the presidential electors uh, choose the president. And it also may establish a time necessarily uniform when we, the people, go to the polls to choose the electors. And the, co- the Congress has accepted that invitation. The current law dates to 1948. And what it says is that the electors are going to meet on December 14th and that we're going to vote for them on November 3rd. Well, of course, this year, we disregarded the November 3rd uh, date. What we did in various states is we stretched out the voting for weeks. And some of the problems that have arisen uh, are traceable to the kinds of things the founders decided uh, to insert the same day clause to prevent. So that uh, puts us, as you say, what do we do about it now? I mean, the the damage is done. One possibility, which I explored in that first Epic Times column that you're talking about, is that Congress could simply call a new election. And people will say, oh, you know, we don't want a new election. They grumble about it. But as you know, other Western style democratic governments, uh, they often have quick elections quickly in succession. I think um, Israel recently had three over an 11 month period. So we could get up and go to the polls for a, a new national election. Um, it, and the Congress could do that simply by passing a law saying that the time of voting is no longer November 3rd, but it's, I don't know, December 1st in the year 2020. But it's pretty clear Congress is not going to do that. You have a Democratic House, and the, the momentum now is behind assuming Joe Biden has been elected. So what's the backup solution? Well, the founders also put very few people know this, but they put state legislatures at the heart of the constitutional system. And part of their obligation and their prerogative is to decide how state legis- how uh, presidential electors are chosen. 
And Congress has actually recognized this because at the site at the, in in the same general section of the law where they say the balloting is on November 3rd, they also say that if for some reason you don't have firm results, uh, somebody's no, nobody's really selected on November 3rd, then the state legislature can decide how to choose the candidate. So this wouldn't apply to all states. It would apply to the six where the, you've got a conflict. But that's where we are now. The, the state legislatures have to stand up and uh, determine how serious the confusion is in their states. If it is serious enough so that we don't know who's been elected in that state, then the state legislature has to deal with it. And that leads well into your second column of the two that we're talking about, which is a Q&A for state legislators and citizens, the Constitution and how to settle the election. And as you have already alluded to, this is of, of particular interest in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, states yes. where the outcome is in at least some state of doubt. Uh, what is it that you hoped to, to spell out in this Q&A that would help resolve this process? Well, again, this has to be handled by the state legislatures. You know, state legislatures and state legislators have gotten very timid in recent years. I mean, they receive the federal largesse, they deal with state matters, and they don't seem to be aware that they've got larger responsibilities. And this is one of them. I think the first responsibility is over the next two weeks or so, they need to determine how serious are the irregularities in their states, not just fraud, but other kinds of irregularities. And did those irregularities likely change the result of the election? And they can do this by two ways. Number one, they can simply watch the lawsuits and see how they, they unfold. The second way that they could do it is by, and I encourage them to do this, holding hearings of their own. Uh, when you've got people coming up and testifying under oath before a legislative committee, you know, I saw this happening, this went wrong. It's a little harder for the press to ignore it or to downplay it uh, than is the case where the allegations are simply in affidavits or, or legal documents. Now, at the end of two weeks, if, for example, the legislature of Arizona decides, you know, there were irregularities, but we really don't think they affected the result, then that's the end of the road in Arizona. If, on the other hand, the legislature of Michigan says, you know, we really think there are se severe problems here, then the legislature of Michigan's got two choices. One is to call us a new election, or the other is to choose the presidential electors themselves. The first option, calling a new election, can be a problem in states where you've got a Republican majority in the legislature, but a Democratic governor. We can discuss how to deal with that, uh, if you wish. Yeah, one of the things that was very interesting in this Q&A, and I'm thinking you're leading into that process, is the fact that I'm sure very few of the people watching the video or listening to the podcast know that the legislatures uh, in their constitutional role in the U.S. Constitution uh, play a part in something called federal functions, which is beyond yes. what they do as state legislatures. If you'd explain a little bit about that and how that would help them address this issue. Yeah, the founders perceived uh, several different roles for state legislatures. One uh, is called interposition, where if the federal government kind of got out of line or was abusing its powers, exceeding its powers, the state legislatures would, would push back. And that's a topic for another, for another podcast, perhaps. The other thing is this doctrine, which the courts call federal functions. And that is the Constitution. You know, when you, when you were in school, you learned the Constitution gives power to the Congress and to the president and to the judiciary. What they didn't tell you is the Congress also gives power to persons and entities who are not part of the federal government at all, including significant powers given to the state legislatures. When they exercise those federal functions, such as deciding how uh, electors are chosen, they, they get their powers directly from the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. They don't get it from the state Constitution. And, uh, or when they, when they ratify a constitutional amendment, same deal. They get their powers directly from the U.S. Constitution. And so there have been many, many cases over the last hundred years where uh, there's been argument over the extent to which state law can govern the exercise 
of legislatures and others in their in their uh, pursuing federal functions. And generally speaking, the courts have said, no, this is something the legislatures do alone. So this brings us back to the situation where, gee, what happens if you've got a Democratic governor who refuses to go along with a new election, who refuses to go along with the selection of electors? You know, what can the legislature do? Uh, the legislature literally can call itself into session even in states where normally only the governor can call it into session. The legislature can literally call itself into session and then choose the electors itself. And it can do that because it's exercising responsibility, not under state law, not under the state constitution, but directly under the federal constitution. And I suspect that the situation you just described is how those legislatures would respond to the inevitable outcry of someone saying, wait a minute, you Republican legislators are stepping into this and trying to change the election, trying to uh, deny the will of the people. Uh, you're saying the Constitution actually calls for this and, and sets this out. Yeah, let's, let's talk politics here for a minute. Um, the um, state legislators, politicians generally tend to be naturally, naturally cauc uh, cautious. It's only the true statesman who's willing to take serious risks. And uh, so, yeah, their concern is, well, people are going to say we're overstepping our bounds. Uh, they've had actually several different options here, but all of them are not necessarily very good politically. One is they can do nothing at all. And they can allow corrupt election results to dictate who sends the presidential electors from their state. That's going to make them vulnerable in party primaries later on, right? The second thing they can do is they can um, uh, they can refuse to send any electors at all to their state capital to vote for president. That's a very ba bad idea. The theory is that if we don't, if enough Republican states don't send electors, then nobody's going to have a majority of the electoral college and it's going to go in the House of Representatives where the Republicans are going to elect the president. The problem with that is that if they don't send electors, then Joe Biden wins because he gets a majority of those electors, that smaller number of electors that are chosen. So doing nothing's a bad alternative. The other alternative is the course I've laid out, which is the responsible course. And yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna have political risks as well, no question. But I don't think it's gonna have any more political risks than either, than either doing nothing about the election and allowing fraudulently chosen electors uh, to vote for the president. And it's no more, politically risk, no more political risk than totally abdicating on their duties and doing nothing. We are speaking with constitutional law expert Robert Nadelson, and obviously this is a, a very important topic, needs to be resolved relatively quickly for 2020. Looking ahead, does something need to happen either at the congressional level, at the state level, combination of the two, so that we don't run into this same sort of problem in 2024 or in future elections? Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to speak as a policy guy now. I mean, this is not a constitutional solution. Uh, I mean, it is constitutional, but it's not based on constitutional law. Uh, I don't believe in mail-in mail balloting. I think it is uniquely subject to breakdown. It is true that it is possible to carry on an honest mail-in election. And, and, to, the, and to step in, uh, when you're talking about mail-in balloting, you are distinguishing, I assume, from the traditional long-standing absentee ballot procedure that had witnesses and people have to request the ballot and, and safeguards built in of that sort? Well, yes, to a certain extent. Um, the, uh, but, but the, the mail-in balloting uh, procedure is, is open for corruption. While it is possible to run a fair election through mail-in balloting, it's more difficult. Um, I also think there's a certain civic virtue and everybody getting together and going down to the polling place and seeing your friends and neighbors. I mean, that's part of what we're losing in America right now, this idea of civic connectedness. That's why we seem to hate each other so much. Um, and so I like the idea of uh, an election day, not an election season. Now on the issue of uh, absentee ballots, I've got grave doubts 
as to whether the traditional absentee ballot is really legal under federal law as it now stands. There are two ways of handling that. One way is Congress has the power to choose the time for choosing electors, so it can make that time a little wider, you know, four or five days, enough for the mail to come through. Uh, the other alternative is that for people who are genuine absentees, there are ways to secure their, to allow them to vote on the actual day of the election. One is by proxy. Someone sends in an affidavit in advance, giving a proxy to a certain person to vote for him. And the other is electronically, which I don't like quite as much because of security concerns, but um, I dislike it less than I dislike uh, the mail-in approach. So there are ways of handling genuine absentee ballots, but I think we really lose something, both in election security and in civic connectedness, when we substitute mail-in ballots for going to the polls and voting in person. Well, certainly some long-term issues to be addressed, as well as the short-term issue of what to do about the 2020 elections and some of the concerns in the states of Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. The columns at the Epoch Times are titled, The Constitution Offers Ways Out of the Election Mess, and a Q&A for state legislators and citizens the Constitution and How to Settle the Election, the author of both pieces, our guest on Headlock, Robert Nadelson. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you. And we hope that you will join us again soon for another edition of Headlock.